Father, you are good, you have spoken, and you have spoken the truth. Father, we thank you indeed for the way in which your spirit has inspired these wonderful words for us to read and to look at tonight. And we do pray that that same spirit uh, would go deep into our lives, into our hearts, uh, that it would convict us of the truth of this message, that we might live in obedience to it. And we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Uh, This week I came across a survey of 11 to 14 year olds. I asked 11 to 14 year olds, what is your dream job? When you grow up as an 11 to 14 year old, what do you want to be? And uh, some of the answers uh, were pretty typical. Uh, There was an answer, a couple of kids wanted to be a professional athlete, professional soccer player. Uh, Others wanted to be a teacher when they grew up. And then there were a couple of other ones which kind of shocked me. These were actually the top two. Number one, the number one thing our youth of today, maybe some of you here today, want to be a YouTuber. You want to be a YouTuber? Yeah, that's it. Number two was to be a designer for Apple. Someone's sitting out there on this, someone's sitting on a wonderful app that's ready to be made. Now, I remember telling my parents when I was growing up what I wanted to be, wait for it, a bank manager. (laughs) I wanted to be a bank manager. Now, I'm not having a go at anyone who's a bank manager here tonight, okay, and this is my sinful, faulty logic that's working out. I wanted to be a bank manager so I could steal all the money. (laughs) I would have access to all the money and I could do with it whatever I wanted. I knew the password to to the vault, all that sort of stuff. Uh, My kids, I've got three kids. I don't even need to ask them what they want to be when they grow up. They've already told me. I've got one daughter who wants to be a gymnast and an artist. I've got another daughter who wants to drive an ice cream van. (laughs) I think that's the faulty bank manager logic playing out. She wants all the ice cream to herself. Uh, And my son, all at the same time, he wants to be a rock star, a policeman and a pastor. (laughs) All at the same time. I love it. I love it. Now, whether it's dream jobs or whether it's holiday destinations, ambitions come in all different shapes and sizes, don't they? Uh, They can come from bucket lists to career goals, from renovations to relationships. And come Isaiah 49 tonight, God is going to show us what his ambitions are. What his ambitions are. In those seven verses that Elise read out for us, we're going to see his sky high, his lofty ambitions for someone that he calls the servant. The servant. Now, just to orientate you in terms of where we're at in the Bible, uh, we're in the Old Testament. Isaiah is one of God's, God's messengers. He's writing at about 800 years before Jesus turns up on that very first Christmas. And uh, is, God had eyes on one nation at that time, the nation Israel. They were his special people. Jerusalem was where they lived. And I've got a map up on the screen here just to show you that Jerusalem, see that Judah, bottom left-hand kind of corner near Egypt? Jerusalem was where Israel was at that time. But because of their sinfulness, because of their stubbornness, God decided to uproot them and take them over to Babylon. If you follow that arrow over to the right-hand side, you'll see Babylon in that green area there. They were prisoners They were held captive in basically modern-day Iraq. And come chapter 49, God is going to to use this special word for this person that he has set his affections on. It's the word servant. Servant. Three times it pops up in just these seven verses here. And this servant language, if you've been with us throughout Isaiah, it's nothing new. Uh, It's going to pop up in a few weeks' time, but it's already popped up in Isaiah 42. Because in Isaiah 42, we saw that this servant was the one upon whom God's spirit lay. He was the one who brought justice to the nations. He was the one who opened the eyes of the blind. And come 49 verse 1, this servant again takes centre stage. Let's have a look. Chapter 49 verse 1. This is the servant speaking, remember? He says, listen to me. You islands, hear this, you distant nations. This servant is demanding a worldwide audience. And the question for me is, who does this servant think he is? 
only God is the one who is recorded as saying, listen to me in the Bible. Those words only come from God's lips. Well, let's keep reading. Verse 1, the second half of verse 1. This is the servant speaking still. Before I, the servant, before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. God has sure got high hopes for this servant. And that is why he'll get a hearing from all people everywhere, no matter what. From the nearest to the furthest. Anyone want to take a guess at what the most watched TV event of all time has been? Of all time. <laughs> the Bachelor. <laughs> no, 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 not, not The Bachelor. <laughs> I didn't watch that. <laughs> It happened back in 2008. 2008, the opening ceremony of the Beijing Olympics. That was the most watched TV event of all time. Now, there were still another 2 billion people who didn't watch that event. Either because they were too young, they didn't have a TV, or they weren't interested at all. But what Isaiah is saying here is that when it comes to God's special servant, no one is going to miss out. Every man, woman and child, those with Facebook feeds, those without, those with TV and radio, those without, everyone is going to hear this servant. Now the other thing about verse 1 is this, is that this servant, oh, he's got huge shoes to fill. Let's have verse 1 back up on the screen. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. I remember before each of um, uh, Teresa's pregnancies, uh, that uh, you know, we'd go in and we'd get a checkup, uh, make sure the baby was healthy. We'd go in and walk into the to see the midwife, and, and my headspace was not about was not around what gender this child was or what this child was going to do when when they were born. No, no. My ambition when I walked through to see the midwife was could I hear a heartbeat? Could I hear a heartbeat? And then once I did, phew, that was it. I was okay. When it comes to God, he's got gigantic expectations for this servant while they were in the womb. And I mean really big. Like, the name's already been picked out. The job description's already been sorted. This kid has got his ma future mapped out already. Let's move on to verse 2. And this time, it's not the servant talking anymore. It's God himself. He's talking about God. He says, verse 2, He, God... Verse 2, he God, he made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In, a shadow, in the shadow of God's hand, he hid me. God made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. Now, poetry was never my thing at school. I, I just couldn't get my head around it. But Hebrew poetry, which is the language that this is written in, that's a much easier proposition. And I'll tell you why. It's because in Hebrew poetry, you admire the poet not for their ability to make things rhyme like we do in English, but rather for their ability to say the same thing, but in different ways. And so back on the screen, what I've done is I've highlighted for you some ideas that happen together. You've got there the, the things in the red. First line, sharpened sword. Third line, polished arrow. Those things go together. Second line, shadow, hid. Fourth line, concealed. God's kind of hidden and made this secret weapon. But it's a weapon that's exactly right for the right job. We're not talking about you know, a nuclear missile that you know, may or may not be in North Korea's backyard at the moment. No, 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 no. We're talking about a weapon that'll do exactly the right thing at the right time. Think about it, that sword that is so sharp that all it takes is just one swing and it gets the job done. You're not forever having to hack through with a blunt, bl a blunt blade. It's, it's not like a, an arrow which is some dodgy, kind of doesn't fly straight. No, this is a polished arrow that once you let go, you can be absolutely guaranteed he's going to hit the target. Now, the, the closest thing I can think of in terms of today's language is we sometimes call things, or we look out for things, that are called a silver bullet. Have you ever heard of that? A silver bullet. And um, it's like um, our search for a cure for cancer. If we find that cure for cancer, that'll be the silver bullet. Because that is the magical one-size-fits-all solution that solves this gigantic, this massive problem. 
And Isaiah is saying here, this servant, he's that silver bullet. He is spot on. Well, so far in these two verses, we've heard a lot about this servant, but we don't know his name. Come to verse 3. Let's have a look. God says, you are my servant, Israel. That's the servant's name, Israel. You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. The Holy One of Israel. That's, God, that's Isaiah's name for God in that, in a, in throughout Isaiah. The Holy One of Israel's servant is Israel. Israel, this nation, this, this special, loved, blessed group of people set apart to display God's beauty and brilliance, his majesty and his magnificence. God had high hopes for Israel indeed. See, all along, the plan was for Israel to, to be the one that attracted the other nations to their God. I've got my trusty Audi camping light here. Israel was meant to be the light to the nations. And you think about it, when you go camping or whenever you're outside, what do moths do? They get instantly attracted to the light. They flock to the light. And that's what Israel was supposed to be. They were to live such holy and perfect and, and God-honouring lives that the nations would see them and be instantly attracted to them, to their God. But sadly, Israel, the lights of the nations, ended up being worse than the nations. They compromised their faith. They, they traded in the true and living God for pretend gods, for man-made idols. And that's why they were booted out of home. Friends, God knows what it's like to taste um, crushed dreams. He knows the disappointment of failed ambitions. It doesn't matter whether you're 15 and you've got friend issues at school. It doesn't matter whether you're 25, you've just been ditched by your boyfriend or your friend. You might be 35 and you're here in Rudy Hill when everyone else is over in New York or London having the time of their lives. I, had a, I helped a good friend, mate of mine move house on Friday and uh, he moved into a really nice house. Like we're talking upstairs, downstairs, lots of big rooms, a deck at the back, granny flat. And I found myself on more than one occasion on that day thinking, man, man, it'd be nice to live here. It's a great suburb, great location. I could see myself living here. Well, that didn't happen, and it's probably not going to happen. We all know what failed ambitions look like. We all know what crushed dreams feel like. And God is no stranger to those feelings. Well, let's go back to Israel. Despite this setback, God is committed to this one nation, and he's determined to start again, this time from within. God has high, high, high hopes for this servant. And speaking of high hopes, I don't think you can get any higher than the hopes that Earl Woods had for his son, Tiger Woods. Do you all know who Tiger Woods is? He's, he's probably one of the greatest golfers in our lifetime. Now, Earl Woods gave this speech about his son, Tiger, back in 1996, just as he was about to turn professional. And he laid it all out on the table, in public, for everyone to hear. Let me read a bit of his speech for you. Earl Wood says this about his son. Please forgive me, but sometimes I get very emotional when I talk about my son. My heart fills with so much joy when I realise that this young man is going to be able to help so many people. So far, so good. Listen to this next bit. Tiger will transcend the game of golf and bring to the world a humanitarianism which has never been known before. The world will be a better place by virtue of his existence and his presence. I acknowledge only my small part in that. I know I was personally selected by God. This is Earl Wood speaking, not me, by the way. <laughs> I was personally selected by God to nurture this young man to bring him to the point where he can make his contribution to humanity. This is my treasure. Please accept it. Thank you. <laughs> now part of it is shock and part of it is you're not too sure how to respond to that like I don't think I've met anyone who's come up to me and said Dan my life is so much better thanks to Tiger Woods <laughs> if that's you I'd love to meet you after this service at NBM we talk a lot about transform lives don't we 
but they're transformed lives by Jesus, not by Tiger Woods. Not by a man who himself has admitted to cheating on over 120 different women. Not by a man who was arrested earlier this year for driving under the influence. Now, don't get me wrong, Tiger Woods can be saved by grace like the rest of us. But here's the thing. Though we might laugh at those ridiculous ambitions that Earl Woods had for his son, Tiger, come verse 6, let's see the ambitions that God has for this servant. Verse 6. God says, It is too small, too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and to bring back those of Israel I have kept. What God is saying here is that restoring just one nation, Israel, eh, piece of cake. This servant can do it with their eyes closed, in their sleep. God's got something way, way, way bigger in mind. Have a look at the rest of verse 6. God says, I will also, also make you a light to the Gentiles. The Gentiles are basically every other nation apart from Israel. The rest of the world, in other words. That my salvation will reach the ends of the earth. Now that is what I call ambition. That is what I call big picture. God's ambitions for this servant, quite frankly, they make Earl Wood's ambitions for his son look tiny, look pathetic, look ridiculous. They're minuscule compared to God's ambitions for this servant. God's ambitions are cosmic, they are global, they are universal. God will bring every single nation, not just Israel, but also Iceland, Ireland, India, Iran, Iraq, Indonesia, Italy. And those are just the nations beginning with I. This servant, he lives up to every expectation that Earl had for Tiger, only he smashes them. And so much more. Yes, he helps so many people. Yes, he changes the world. But did you notice what verse of verse 6 said? Through you, my servant, God says, my salvation will reach the ends of the earth. Aren't you glad that you live in a time after this servant has taken on flesh? I know I am. Because God's silver bullet, he is no longer hidden, he is risen. He's no longer hiding and concealed. He's on display for everyone to see. God's salvation has come to anyone and to everyone. And part of that salvation going to the ends of the earth includes us here in Rudy Hill today, 2017. And so friends, if you are here today and you have not yet said yes to Jesus, if you have not yet accepted this wonderful news, this is the best News you will hear today, tomorrow, for the rest of your life. That Jesus is that light to the nations. And he's asking you, come out of the darkness and come into the light. Jesus, the light of the world. He's the one who's offering you rescue, restoration, reconciliation with the God of this universe. This salvation was achieved through one man and one man only. One perfect and obedient servant. One who came not to, not to be served, but to serve. One who gave his life as a ransom for others. One who laid down his life so that we might live. And one who did not stay dead, but three days later rose and walked out of that grave. He is the one who has smashed sin and defeated death. He is the ultimate servant. He is the light to the nations. That's all part of his job description. Salvation is here. These are good times. Up on the screen is a picture from, uh, taken back in 2003. And it's a picture of George Bush, the US president at the time, giving what was now, what's now known as his famous mission accomplished speech. And Bush came, he gave that speech on board an aircraft carrier. And he posed for photos with all the crew before he gave this speech. Now let me quote for you some of the words that came from Bush as he was making this speech. He said, and I quote, that combat operations in 2003 in Iraq had ended. That the United States and its allies had prevailed. And did you see that banner that was there behind him as he gave his speech? What does it say? 
Mission accomplished. It was anything but mission accomplished. Not when another 155,000 lives will be lost. That's not mission accomplished. And George Bush later on went to say, yep, sorry guys, caught it a bit too early, it was my mistake, I jumped the gun, I shouldn't have said it, mission accomplished, my bad. But to what extent of Isaiah 49 do we say mission accomplished? That's my question for you tonight, friends. God's servant has turned up, tick. Jew and Gentile, the nations, everyone can receive this offer of salvation, tick. Mission accomplished, right? Well, no, not exactly. And this is where we now are going to fast forward 800 years to that second passage that Elise read for us, the book of Acts. Now, as I said, as we, before we read this again, let me just set the context. Jesus has risen, he's reigning at God's right hand, and Paul and Barnabas are taking this message of salvation literally to the ends of the earth. They're in Turkey, in a city called Antioch. And having brought this message of the forgiveness of sins, uh, the, 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 the Jews are hurling abuse on them. They want them to get out of town. And this is where we pick up Acts chapter 13, verse 46. Up on the screen, let's read it together. Paul and Barnabas answered them, the Jews, boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honoured the word of the Lord. And all who were appointed for eternal life believed. Sound familiar? Paul and Barnabas here are applying Isaiah 49 to themselves. To themselves. They are saying, yes, Jesus is the author of this salvation, but we are his messengers of this salvation. We get the privilege of getting our hands dirty, of continuing the servant's ministry, of taking this wonderful news that Jesus is the light to the ends of the earth. And they are willing to cop the abuse that comes left, right and centre as they do that. This is the same Paul who later on in Romans says this, in Romans chapter 15 verse 20. He says, it is always, always been my ambition to preach the gospel of Christ where it was not known. Now that's ambition. Paul, this is what puts a fire in Paul's belly. This is what gets him up in the morning. It's this tunnel vision that he, his life goal is to preach the wonderful news of Jesus. And so in answer to that, that question I asked earlier, is it time to call mission accomplished? Not yet. No way. Paul and Barnabas didn't see it that way, and neither should we. And that's why we as a church have those, and Rahan prayed it, for it so beautifully, they are God-desired outcomes. To see 1,500 gathered here Sunday by Sunday at Rudy Hill, to see 1,000 new disciples made, to see this, the churches of the western region of Sydney strengthened, those are our godly ambitions as a church. And so we thank God for the fact that 80 people, that's right, 80 people just this year alone have said yes to Jesus. That is a wonderful thing. 80 people from all the nations of the world, be they Maltese, be they Middle Eastern, be they Chinese, Anglo, be they Islander. That's why we have those translation booths over there that we use particularly in the morning service. That's why we have a bus outside that is begging for drivers. It's that so people can come and hear and do exactly what you've been doing, hearing this wonderful message of Jesus being the light to the nations. It's why we gather as God's people, here as big group and in small group during the week. It's not because we've got nothing better to do. It's because we want to give expression as we look around the room to the very fact that yes, God's message of salvation has come and it here is amongst us. And that goes both ways as well. People come here, but we go out. And so we've already sent one church plant out. There's going to be more coming in the future. In the next two months, we're going to be sending Mark and Gina Borg and their wonderful family over to Malta. We're going to be sending Jerome and Indra over to Southeast Asia. Friends, as long as we have empty chairs in this auditorium, in front of you, behind you, next to you, 
as long as we have friends who are facing a Christless eternity, it is not yet mission accomplished. Not by a long shot. God has uprooted nations and moved them into your backyard, into your workplace, for you to be able to share the wonderful news of Jesus with them. John Piper puts it like this. He says up on the screen, he says, Mission exists because worship of God doesn't. Mission exists because worship doesn't. And by that he means is that as long as there are people who don't yet worship the God of this universe, the God who made them, the God who died for them, then we have a task to be done. We have a mission to accomplish, to tell the nations about Jesus. Uh, this week I came across a video that was put out by Crossview where our very own John and Betty Sharp and Matt and Grace Hillier uh, serve. And, and, they, and in this video it talked about how, did you realise that there are 7,000 living languages spoken in this world? 7,000. Now, 16,000 of them don't yet have a word of the Bible translated into their language yet. Behind those 16,000 languages are 200 million souls that hang in the balance. 200 million. Like the Pahari people, the people group in Nepal. A population of about 13,000. It's the same size as Rudy Hill. And each and every one of them, as far as we know, sacrifice animals to the earth god. Mission accomplished is when the Pahari people of Nepal get to read for themselves in their own mother tongue that Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice for them and their sins. Mission accomplished is when they get to discover that there is one true and living God in this world. Mission accomplished is when Jesus turns up and appears to judge the living and the dead. When every knee will bow willingly or unwillingly that's when we get to call mission accomplished. And so friends, in the meantime, what are we to do? What, what are we to do while we wait for mission accomplished? Well, it seems crystal clear to me, and I hope so to you too, that God's grand and glorious agenda, that God's ambitions, well, they ought to be our ambitions too, don't they? You think about it. The only way that your ambitions, your personal ambitions, are guaranteed to become a reality is if they line up to God's, God's ambitions. Because what are our ambitions? Our ambitions, at the best, might become a reality. They might. Some of them we might fall short in. Others we may reach. And even if we do reach them, it's not as if that lasts into eternity, does it? A, a few years ago, I had this ambition to run a marathon. And thanks to my, my training buddy, Paul Schumach, over there, it became a reality. Now, a couple of years later, I've done the marathon. Big deal. So what? I don't think I can run it, run it again. <laughs> but your ambitions are just the same. When you reach your ambitions, chances are you'll be going, OK, that was nice. That felt good. I'll look for another one now. But that's not what it's like when, it's, when it comes to having God-focused, God-orientated, godly ambitions just like Paul did back in Romans 15. Ambitions that have eternal value. Ambitions that are not self-centred, but other person-centred and God-centred. Ambitions for God's salvation to reach the ends of the earth. And friends, it's a team effort, isn't it? We all get to play our part. The one who came to serve us, well, we get to serve him. And that can take all different shapes and sizes. Some of us will go overseas. Some of us will support and send. Some of us will hunt down those opportunities here and look around for them. But all of us, all of us can pray. All of us can pray. Uh, every day I, I, I do a five minute car trip with my kids and drop them off to school. And uh, in that short five minute trip, we've stumbled across a little routine that as we cross the train line over here at Rudy Hill before the RSL, I ask my kids, kids, what country are you going to pray for today? What country are you going to pray for today? And my son really loves praying for the Ukraine at the moment. My daughter, she instantly shoots back, let's pray for India. My other daughter wants to pray for Hungary. Not because she's hungry, but because she wants to pray for Hungary. Sorry, there's a bad dad joke there. But that is how... that. 
friends, if you're not praying for the nations, can I highly commend it to you that you incorporate it into your diet of prayers. And we've recently stumbled across this app. Uh, it's also a book, but it's an app called Operation World that you can download onto your phone. And what it does, it gives you a country each day to pray for. It's a wonderful thing. So how, can I highly commend it to you? Friends, let's pray. Let's beg. Let's come before our Father in heaven and ask him to shine his light into the darkness of so many people, so many people groups, so many nations that are around us. Because after what we've seen today from Isaiah 49, you can be sure that God is committed to answering that prayer point again and again and again and again. And so as we transition now to a time where we get to celebrate what this wonderful servant has done on our behalf as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, uh, and uh, one of our own pastors, Scott Lavin, is going to come and perform, perform an item for us. For, for you to reflect on, mainly, but can I invite you, if you're one, if you're someone who has accepted that wonderful sacrifice of the Lord Jesus, to come forward and to take a bit of bread, a bit of juice, and then return to your seats, and then I'll come back up here after a word of explanation, we'll remember what Jesus has done for us. But for now, let's pray. Oh, Father, what a wonderful, what a kind God you are indeed. That you have called people from every tribe, every nation, every tongue to gather around the Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you that you have rescued us and that your ambition is to see many more people from all over the globe come and bow their knee before this wonderful servant. Father, what a privilege it is to carry on the ministry of Jesus in whatever uh, place we find ourselves in. Father, we pray that your spirit would convict us, that it would cause us to jump on board, to play our part, no matter how big or how small. Because we have a ministry that has been made possible thanks to this wonderful servant to take the message of Jesus, the light of the world, to the nations. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.